Quiet on the set, make sure my mic is on There is Dre and Juju Dog diving towards the pylon Go for two, so damn rude, recognize authority Spitting tips for fantasy, no way you're outscoring me Bold predictions with conviction every single day Sports addiction, no restriction, kicking game like Pele He's the greatest, what's the basis? Pick an athlete, let's debate this game Outrageous trading places, sudden death, take ten paces Turn and shoot, boys the truth, mamba mentality Future greats take their place, dreams be Become reality, low and outside, knocked it out the park. Your boy discovered fire like a rock with a spark. Refs acting like Neanderthals, phantom flags, nothing calls. Heartbreak causes tragic falls. Every week discuss it all. Settle in, listen up. Free of time like Andrew Luck. Show's about to stop. I suggest you buckle up. Welcome in to this week's edition of the Quarterback is right, but probably overpaid. On this week's episode, we have some fantastic, outstanding guests. Coming down first from the Great White North, Michael the Cac, Cacamo, Cacamo, come on down. <laughs> yeah, let's go, let's go. Woo! Now, Mike, Mike, as we bring you down to the stage here, you have to tell us about these Timbits and how amazing they are. Our podcast, Face Off Hockey Pod, is not affiliated with Tim Hortons, although I'm going to eat as many as I can, so they are. Timbits are your average little donut in a little ball. They are great for having on the go, which actually now I just found out is distracted driving here in <laughs> Canada and can get fined up to $3,000, so might have to stop doing that. But they're good for birthday parties, little gift baggies, little treats while you have a podcast. All that good stuff. There are little donuts on the go. Fantastic values. Fantastic treats. Drop on down to Tim Horton. All righty. Our next contestant from Albuquerque, New Mexico. You know him. You love him. Andre. Dre. Win. Come on ooh. down. Ooh, 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 ooh. All righty, Dre. So, Albuquerque, New Mexico. How's the weather? How's the drug trade? How's Albuquerque doing these days? Uh, it's actually, you know, been a little bit crazy. So we had one day of snow and it came really quickly. Snow and rain, I should say, froze over the night. And then Albuquerque, since we live in the middle of a desert, anytime there's a little bit of snow, the entire city shuts down and freaks out, doesn't know what to do. So luckily, I had the day off yesterday. Um, other than that, though, the drug trade is at an all-time high, right? People are getting shot left and right, so it's a fantastic place to live. Oh, yeah. Albuquerque. Top 10 endorsement. Albuquerque, New Mexico. True. <laughs> exactly like Breaking Bad. Exactly <laughs> like Breaking Bad, if anybody's interested. <laughs> really making a huge endorsement for the CAC here on this podcast on his future trips to Albuquerque, New Mexico. All righty, guys. Well, let's get into... The price is right, but the quarterbacks are probably overpaid. So, with that said, the person that can bid the correct amount for the 2020 NFL quarterback franchise tag closest without going over will get the first chance to spin the wheel and send these quarterbacks to their proper destinations. So, alrighty, I'm going to start with our first contestant, the CAC. So, what is the NFL 2020 franchise tag? I'm going to go with $15 million American. All righty. $15 million American. A year. A Put year. It on the board. Million a year. All right. <laughs> Andre, knowing that the original bid is going to stand at $15 million, what is your bid? I'm going to go with $20 million. $20 million. Okay. So $15 million, $20 million. The correct amount is... 26895000 So, Andre, you have the opportunity to spin that wheel. So, the first destination, and cutting the music, because I think if we play that anymore, YouTube probably is going to hit us with a copyright. Probably. Uh, hey, real like. quickly, I want to ask, Michael, <laughs> do they have Prices Right in Canada? Yes, we do. And we, oh no, I was going to say, we have our own version of the Family Feud now, but we do watch reruns of Bob Barker and Drew Carey. I used to watch that oh, nice. show all the time. <laughs> Bob Barker knows no borders, man. The price is always <laughs> right. I was going to say, okay. I was outside the studio where they were filming it when I was in LA, so it's a, fun, okay. it's a fun time. It's a shame you didn't get a chance to get on there. I mean, probably have a better chance at better prizes than this podcast has the opportunity to offer at this point. We're still working on that budget, right, Trey? 
Yeah, I mean, you keep offering everybody, you know, free green chili, free visits to New Mexico and whatever else you could offer. So we do not have the budget for that currently, but maybe one day. Hey, come on. That's that's what we have you for. This show needs at least one strong financial backer. I, I can manage the finances. I cannot generate the finances, Juju. That, they're two different things. All right. Well, let's get into the game, guys. So as I mentioned, we're going to generate a team. We're going to spin that wheel. And we're going to match up a quarterback to their proper destination for the 2020 NFL season. So the first team that we are going to pick a quarterback for is going to be the Miami Dolphins. They had a bit of a rough season but they came together at the end dre so dre spin that will oh and Jameis winston goes to the miami dolphins so dre tell me about the miami dolphins outlook with famous Jameis winston yeah, I, I guess we're going to ignore the fact that they have draft picks just for this hypothetical situation, right? I actually think that they wouldn't be too bad. Miami started to come on here at the end of the year. They will have other draft picks that they're able to secure from shipping off some of their talent, in which we had thought they were a little bit puzzling of moves throughout much of the season. But it looks like they've got a good coach with Flores. They've got good draft picks. And it seems like they could do a whole lot. Jameis Winston, we also know, is a capable quarterback. He definitely throws just as many touchdowns as he does interceptions, but he was able to get Tampa Bay some wins this year. So I think Miami would definitely up their win percentage. However, I still think that uh, they're about a year or two still removed from the playoffs. Okay. What does this mean for the quarterbacks already on their roster? Josh Rosen and Ryan Fitzpatrick. What do you think their win total in 2020 is? Let's see. So with Jameis Winston, I think that they would win, especially given, like I said, all their other draft picks, the talent that they would retain. I think that they could win about seven games. I do think that they ship off Rosen, though. So I do think that they move him to another team that's willing maybe to give up a second round or a third round draft pick. Fair enough. Well, you heard it here first. Jameis will make the Miami Dolphins a seven-win team with that LASIK eye surgery, though. Watch out for that first 50 <laughs> touchdown, 50 interception season. He's no longer seeing double-double, Juju, so he should be a little bit more accurate. I don't know if that helps core blindness, though. <laughs> maybe not. Okay, so moving on to our next contestant. This is your opportunity, Michael the Tkak. Kakamo to spin that wheel. So you are doing it for the New Orleans Saints. Let's spin that wheel. Oh, Alex Smith. All righty, the New Orleans Saints gained Alex Smith coming off a year and a half removed from almost losing his leg. Kind of a bold strategy, a safe pick for this franchise. What will Mm -hmm. Alex Smith do in New Orleans for the Saints coming off a 13-3 and season? Oh, wow. (laughs) I'm not as well versed in the NFL as I am with hockey. But if he stays healthy, he should be able to keep the Saints in contention, I believe. I mean, a little safe for a little bit of a a heartbreak with the referees calling some games. But uh, I think uh, they'll still keep him in contention, probably at the top of uh, the NFC South. Andre, what do you think about this team losing all three of their quarterbacks off their roster? Drew Brees, Taysom Hill, Teddy Bridgewater, and going with Alex Smith. A bit of a bold choice. Yeah, that would definitely be a bold choice. Though I do think that that may be able to save them a little bit when it comes to cap space, right? Like you almost get it at a discount, what you would be getting, you know, some of these other top your quarterbacks right especially coming off of that injury you can maybe negotiate a little bit better even though we know that Alex Smith at one point was in one of the top tiers I'm not going to say the highest tier of quarterbacks though he was pretty good he wasn't bad we saw him at a few stops and he was definitely able to make some of those playoff runs um, or at least get to the playoffs so I do think that is the opportunity again like I said to get a pretty solid quarterback at a discount that we have seen that injury has totally ruined careers and derailed careers completely before so I think it is a little bit risky, but that may allow them to bulk up the rest of their team, which they already have a really solid team all around. Do you think they stay at a 13-3 and record? I do not. I just think that it's, one, just difficult to continue to go 13-3 and year after year. Um, and they've had two really good seasons so far back-to-back. So I do think that they regress a little bit further. Uh, with Alex Smith, given that he's coming off injury, right, and a year away, though we have we did see, right, that uh, Jimmy G was able to do it and, and did it successfully, I still think that they were rest a little bit and so I would say probably closer to 11 and 5 
Not that big of a drop-off. Still sounds good enough to win the NFC South. Mm-hmm. All righty. Well, our next franchise that needs to figure out their quarterback situation is the Chicago Bears. So a couple of years ago, it took a big chance drafting Mitch Trubisky over Patrick Mahomes and Deshaun Watson, which some would say is a bold strategy. Now they're currently in quarterback limbo. Let's make a proper pairing. Let's spin that wheel and get them a QB. Oh, Dak Prescott now (laughs) with the Chicago Bears. Andre, how do you think this trade came about? How do you think Dak Prescott landed in Chicago? So apparently Chicago wanted an upgraded Mitch Trubisky. So they wanted Mitch Trubisky 2.0, right? So I really do think that Dak and, and Mitch were to just have like a similar style of play, right? Like They can run. They don't have like a super good deep ball threat, right? But they sometimes can make passes. If you're not asking too much of them, they can win you the game. Though I will say that Dak probably right now is the better of the two quarterbacks. Had it been last season, right? So I'm not talking about the season that just ended, but the season before, that might have been arguable. But right now, I think Dak definitely looks like the better of the the players. And so maybe I guess the way that this situation could possibly come about is that, (laughs) that Dallas really wants Tom Brady. And I've heard his name linked to Dallas. I have heard Tom Brady's name linked to almost everywhere, right? Including the Raiders, including Dallas, all over the place. And so maybe Dallas is confident that they'll get Tom Brady. So they're willing to move off of Dak Prescott, though I don't know why you would do that, especially an aging Tom Brady. And they're willing to take Mitch as the backup. You know, if this does come about, I could see it being all generated from Dak Prescott not being too fond of playing on that franchise tag. We know that earning $26 million in a given season is a hard thing for a quarterback to do. And I pray for him because I don't know how you could get by on that contract. I know. God bless his soul, man. If anybody has to live on 26 mil, actually, it's closer to 27 mil if we're going to be honest. So, you know, 27 million just sitting in your bank account. Hard life. <laughs> prayers up here. All right, Kak. So you have the honor here of introducing the newest franchise to the NFL, moving on from Oakland to the bright city of Las Vegas, Nevada, the Las Vegas Raiders. They have already announced that they're going to be pursuing Tom Brady this offseason, leaving Derek Carr in a sticky situation as he already bought his house in Vegas. So let's see what their quarterback situation ends up after the season. Let's spin that wheel. And Joe Burrow, the LSU quarterback, the Heisman Trophy winner, the national champion, 15-0 season in college, goes to the Las Vegas Raiders. So how is it that the Las Vegas Raiders, currently drafting middle of the road in this year's NFL draft, are going to be going up for the number one quarterback prospect in the league? Well, if everyone's seen draft day, you know that tensions can be high when someone puts a down payment on a house uh, or an organization that they think they're going to be playing in a long time. In terms of Joe Burrow, Las Vegas is a very, very fun place to play. If you've been watching the Golden Knights in the NHL, a lot of the stars are coming to Las Vegas and it's helped their game improve pretty well. So if that can translate to the NFL franchise, then Joe Burrow might have some good luck. It certainly would be a bit of a gamble for the Las Vegas Raiders to trade up and pick up Joseph Burrow. The interesting strategy here is if you're the Bengals and you make the decision to not draft Joe Burrow at number one, what do you make of that decision, Andre? I think that they would be idiots if they did pass up on it, right? Like, I mean, I know this is all hypothetical, right? And we're just saying, hey, here's sort of the situation of how things would end up. But yeah, you have a generational talent in Joe Burrow. And as much people are saying, hey, it was because he was a part of a system, right? He wasn't really even good until he got to LSU, right? And then Coach Orgeron was able to put all the pieces together. He's able to get all the talent to make Joe Burrow successful. Still, at the end of the day, Joe Burrow proved that he was the best quarterback in all of college. He did it by winning the Heisman. And then he also did it by beating the teams that he had beaten when it came to the uh, to the college playoffs, right? So he's able to beat some really, really tough teams especially Clemson to end it all. And a lot of people had said Clemson had the best quarterback in all of college. Not only that, but Joe Burrow being an Ohio kid, if you're the Cincinnati Bengals and you pass up on that opportunity, you're going to get totally roasted by your fans, by the league. Everybody's going to hate you. That being said, I would not put it past Cincinnati to do something (laughs) stupid, right? We know that they have bad ownership, so they might do something dumb and, you know, skip over Joe Burrow and possibly get sent all the way out to Vegas. Like, uh, 
uh, like the CAC said, right, is all that nice nightlife, right? Las Vegas being in bright lights. I think Joe Burrow has been in that situation before. He sort of has been on that big stage. So he might be able to flourish out there in, in Vegas, right, and be able to help elevate the game. Yeah, you know, I mean, it wouldn't be the first time that the Raiders have drafted a LSU quarterback number one. Uh, hopefully they have more success than Jamarcus Russell's tenure over there. So our next franchise that needs to figure out their quarterback situation. So we already determined that Dak Prescott's going to be playing in Chicago this coming year. So who's going to be playing in Dallas? Well, you know what, Dre? You know how we're going to solve this situation? You know the three-word answer that's going to fix that? Oh, Dre, I want you to tell me, what are those three words that's going to fix the QB situation in Dallas? Spin that wheel, Juju. Hey, there we go. <laughs> and Taysom Hill is going to be the next Dallas Cowboys starting quarterback. So, <laughs> oh, man. So is Taysom Hill more than a gadget player? Because according to him, this week, he is a franchise quarterback. And if the Saints don't agree, he'll find somewhere else. Can't, will Jerry Jones be happy to oblige? I think it's difficult because we've only seen him in sort of that quarterback role a little bit, right? We haven't had too much exposure to him in that quarterback role. So we've seen he's sort of that jack of all trades. He's that Swiss army knife that you could plug him in as a receiver, as a blocker, as a quarterback. You could do all kinds of things with Taysom Hill. But I do wonder if he has that full quarterback potential. Now, again, similarly to, you know, Alex Smith that we were talking about earlier, because of the situation that he's in, right, he's not a proven quarterback. He hasn't shown that he's one of the elite quarterbacks that would demand the 20s to $30 million range. You may be able to get him for pretty cheap, but he is a freak of nature athlete that can play all positions. And therefore, maybe he is really good at quarterback. Who knows? But it would definitely be a gamble. Well, maybe if the quarterback thing doesn't work out, they can always play him at tight end over the ghost of Jason Witten. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he would be a lot faster than Jason Witten. I'm pretty sure I'm faster than Jason Witten. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's not hard to beat. I'm pretty sure the CAC after a full Timbit like diet, 50 pounds of Timbits might be faster than Jason Witten. <laughs> Probably. If you have a Timbit on the other side, I'll definitely, I'll definitely make it. I'll definitely make it faster than him. And he has to run through 50 feet of snow in Canada. No joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And well, we got hit with a little bit of snow this, this uh, earlier this week. So uh, yeah, 50 feet of snow for sure. Nothing that we're not used to up here. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we've already know that Cincinnati traded out of the number one pick to not select Joe Burrow. So who are they selecting? It's going to be up to the cat and the will to determine who is going to be their next franchise quarterback so let's spin that will in in a surprise move the cincinnati Bengals decide to re-sign andy dalton so that's a thing <laughs> go with what you know right <laughs> go with what you know <laughs> I'm always about consistency. Uh, but Andy Walton, just uh, he's my, my problem is with the, uh, the, the interceptions there. If he can kind of scale that back down a bit, he's got 16, he had 16 touchdowns last year, but I, I always, I'm a big stickler about uh, the interceptions. And if he can somehow scale that back, I'm trying to look at where Cincinnati finished. Uh, oh, well, two and 14. So sure. Why not? I mean, the owner is probably just going to probably, you know what, go with what you know. I'm sure he's a nice guy. His hair matches the uniform. Go for it. Hey, ain't no stopping the Red Rocket when he gets going. Dre, what do you think of Cincinnati's decision to retain Andy Dalton after getting that huge haul from the Las Vegas Raiders? <laughs> so, again, this would be the most Cincinnati thing in the world, right? Besides, besides them and the Browns being some of the worst-run franchises in all the sports history, right? I could totally see them saying, hey, you know what? We're going to throw a curveball into things and take somebody else besides a quarterback in the first round. And you know what? We're going to re-sign Andy Dalton. You know, just like Michael said, stick with what you know and what they know is being bad. So they're going to stick. You know, what's the definition for insanity, I wonder? Isn't it doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, expecting a different result? I thought that was being a Bengals fan. <laughs> oh, ouch. Sorry, Bengals fans. We're roasting you right now. <laughs> I mean, they know. They know. It couldn't be worse than living in Cincinnati. I, I mean, <laughs> we have. We're just gonna have a whole city that we just can't be streamed in. Honestly, the entire state, right between you know, Eris not even knowing the difference between their cities. 
<laughs> and us roasting, you know, Cincinnati, the entire state's going to hate us. To catch you up to speed on this one, Michael, so we had an episode come out, right? I'm editing, and I keep having, like, our co-hosts on the Fantasy Football Podcast keep saying the battle for Cleveland when he obviously meant Ohio. Cleveland is not a state in the U.S., just in case you're not familiar on your U.S. geography, that is in fact the case. But someone should probably tell U.S. citizen, Aaron Splatingly, the yeah. proper geography for the United States. Well, hold on. I was also, okay, so that blows my mind. Also, I was under the assumption that Kansas City was in Kansas State. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's a mistake I could imagine many people making. Uh, hey, man, I made it. So, <laughs> <laughs> I just sat there and took, tucked my tail between my legs. And I went, oh, yeah, how could you get that fixed? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I know you know about as much as our president though so so you know don't feel bad <laughs> <laughs> oh god <laughs> okay so the next team up on this list that needs to figure out their quarterback situation is a team that's under new ownership the Carolina Panthers they also have a new coach so I guess you could say there's a new role in Carolina who is going to be their quarterback though is going to be the question we need to answer on this podcast so let's go ahead and spin this bitch <laughs> All righty, Tua Tagovailoa, whatever you want to pronounce his last name as, he is officially going to be the starting quarterback for the Carolina Panthers once that hip probably heals. So Andre, Tua, Carolina, is this a match made in heaven? I mean, I do think that stylistically, now granted, Ron Rivera's gone, right? So they've got a new coach, they've got a sort of a new system. But stylistically, Tua is one of those athletic quarterbacks, similar to a Cam Newton, maybe a better thrower of the football than Cam Newton. Though, of course, that was at the college level, not at the pro level. So I do think that it could work and it would be electric, right? Like Tua being one of the best quarterbacks to come out of college, possibly in a while, as long as he continues to play like, like he did before the injury. I could definitely see the fans being excited about it now that being said we just don't know what it's going to be like those hip dislocations can be pretty serious and uh, we don't know if he'll ever be the same if he'll have that same level of athleticism though with the miracles of modern science right maybe he went up to Canada to visit Mike and got some good uh, <laughs> some good free med- medicine and, and health care up there but uh, I do wonder if he'll be okay coming off of that injury so I would be a little bit worried if they were to commit to him here in this first year uh, second and third year out from that injury may Maybe I'd be willing to commit to him a little bit more. Well, from all indications, apparently his hip has healed. He has been cleared just in time for, you know, his pro day, the combine. I doubt he runs in the combine. I think they might keep that all saved up for his official pro day. I think everything's all systems go. And if you're talking about a situation like Carolina, I do think it is a decent fit. It's not a situation where they're going to come in and expect him to start right away. And if you told me he fell to Carolina in the draft, given the injury, it actually is one of these that probably makes the most sense out of this whole spin the wheel concept so far. So I think it's actually a really good fit. Mike, do you have a take on this? You know what? I have high hopes because he's played in Alabama and my favorite uh, bachelor contestant right now is from Alabama and I have high hopes for her. So I'm going to be positive with Tua and I think he's going to get in shape, going to heal real well, and he's possibly going to make the Carolina Panthers have six wins this season. Possibly. Okay, so now our next team, we have to figure out what they're doing at quarterback is going to be the Tennessee Titans. Last year's surprise team out of the AFC made it all the way to the AFC Championship game, starting Ryan Tannehill, who people have their question of. Will they run it back with Ryan Tannehill or will they go to the free agency will to make their decisions. Let's find out right now. And Cam Newton is now officially a Tennessee Titan. Cam Newton, Tennessee, Derrick Henry. Hmm. There is a lot of possibility in that running game. Cack, lead us off here. Um, I think that uh, if he stays healthy, that the Tennessee Titans are going to continue staying the course. You got to be careful with those injuries. Last year, he only started two games. So uh, I'm just looking at his previous uh, three years and the, the stats on that. And he seems to be pretty consistent. So as long as he stays healthy, the Tennessee Titans might have a chance. You know, I do see like a opportunity here in the power run game. So Cam Newton, we all know he's a big bodied quarterback. He's been able to run over people in the past. We know what a man child like Derrick Henry is. So those two in the backfield are a scary combination, both 6'6", 200 some pounds running at you. Not like something you want to see if you're an opposing defender. Dre, what do you think of the Tennessee Titans outlook with Cam Newton at the helm as opposed to Ryan Tannehill? 
Yeah, I think you're exactly right. They would probably double down on that running game. Cam is a little bit more proven of a quarterback, I should say, than than Tannehill, although Tannehill did have some success. You know, Cat brings up a great point when it comes to the injuries, though, is you have to be really weary of the injury and the injury history that Cam Newton has had. And if you are going to use him sort of as your dual threat quarterback where, you know, he could pass or he could run, if he gets hit a little bit too hard, that could be another possibly season or two ending injury. So we got to be careful with that. That being said, Tennessee is probably a pretty good environment for him as far as elevation and, and, you know, how cold it gets, the temperatures. They're a little bit more moderate than if he were to play in a place like a Minnesota where his body would be cold and and getting hit. So I I worry a little bit more about injuries up there, a little bit further north, right, and possibly higher altitudes and where it can get cold in the wintertime. Tennessee, though, I think he would be all right. And as long as, you know, Derrick Henry can keep playing at at the level that he has been, I could see Cam definitely leading this team to, to more success. I guess my question here, so coming off an AFC championship game, do you think that they have a Super Bowl ceiling with Cam Newton at quarterback, assuming he stays healthy? <sighs> assuming good health, we've seen Cam Newton get to a Super Bowl before. We have not seen Ryan Tannehill do it. So I'm going to say if you were to simply swap out that piece, all things being equal, I think they could. The main issue is going to be is there is that juggernaut known as the Kansas City Chiefs who are a big problem for the entire AFC, right? And I think that, yes, they potentially could get to a Super Bowl. Will they be able to outscore the Kansas City Chiefs and the Baltimore Ravens? That's going to be a little bit hard, right? As they also have a very high Super Bowl ceiling as those two other teams. Okay, well, we're going to stick this conversation in the AFC South as we're going to look at the Indianapolis Colts. So last year, they had the surprise retirement of Andrew Luck. They pieced it together with Jacoby Brissett, looked decent at the season's early going, and they were kind of just middle of the pack when everything finished out. Jacoby Brissett, do I believe he's a franchise quarterback? Probably not. So let's see who his replacement is going to be or who's at least going to be paired with him in Indianapolis. Oh, Philip Rivers. So Philip Rivers is going to Indianapolis. Now, we know we have a certain colleague that would be is very upset with the recent news that he will not be back in Los Angeles. But what do you think this Colts team looks like with a veteran proven veteran like Philip Rivers, Dre? I would want to say that it would make them better, but Philip Rivers is so old, right? Like we can see his age. And I'm not saying he's old from just like a number standpoint, right? Like obviously he's not like in his 60s or anything like that but when it comes to football years Philip Rivers is definitely old we sort of saw that aging happen before our eyes this year right and especially with all of the quarterbacks sort of in his in his draft class right so Eli obviously retired this year Big Ben got hurt and had to have Tommy John surgery and then Philip Rivers just did not look very good and everybody had said like hey Philip Rivers is one of those really good quarterbacks one of the best quarterbacks to never reach a Super Bowl and I would have you know I would agree with that over the course of his career he's an extremely talented talented quarterback but he just did not look good so it's hard to say you know towards the end of the year the Colts didn't look good I don't think that they would look any better with Philip Rivers though yeah I don't think this is a playoff team with Philip Rivers but I will say this the Colts offensive line is definitely the right type of offensive line you need with a non-mobile quarterback like Philip but I don't think the weapons are nearly as good as what he adds out there in San Diego or Los Angeles or whatever you want to call them these days this isn't a difference maker this is a bridge quarterback if I ever saw one. Okay, our next team up is going to be Tampa Bay. So we already determined Jameis is not going to be back next season. His replacement needs to be found. So who's going to be the next quarterback to throw 30 interceptions in Tampa? Well, let's uh, spin that wheel and figure this out. Cue it up. (laughs) Derek Carr. Moving on from the Las Vegas Raiders, officially moving all the way across the country to Tampa Bay to be paired up with Bruce Arians. Cac, is this a pairing you can see benefiting both parties? Tampa Bay getting Derek Carr. So Tampa Bay finished seven and nine this season. With Derek Carr, they might that 500 sub 500 team. Not to say that it's going to be a Derek Carr problem. I think he would be a dependable starting QB. It's the people that you'll have around him. But I I see this as more of a lateral move, but maybe that could be just me. Guys passed for over 4,000 yards the last two years, but with a different team in Tampa Bay. So who knows if that improves? 
or digresses, I still say that they're going to be around a 500 team. Well, let's see. So Tampa, Bruce Arians, he's a dynamic coach. He's managed to revitalize plenty of careers. He took Carson Palmer off the Raiders and made him fantastic in Arizona. Do you think he can have that same effect for Derek Carr? We know he's less mistake-oriented than Jameis. What do you think on that pairing, Dre? Yeah, I think if there's anybody that can help Derek Carr out, it would be Bruce Arians. I don't think that they're going to be world beaters by any means, right? I don't think that they're going to be amazing. I don't think they're going to be, you know, the team to beat. Though Derek Carr and Bruce Arians together, I definitely think that that could be right above that 500 range, you know, like the cat was saying. I think they would be possibly in playoff contention. They might even be a really scary team. Especially, I thought Derek Carr for the first half of the season and the Raiders in general overperformed what I thought that they would. I think it would also just be a good change of pace for Derek Carr. He's sort of been, I, I hate to say it's bullying, but he's almost been bullied when he was with the Oakland Raiders, right? Like a lot of people saying that he was crying on some of those hits or that he's not tough, even though the dude played with like a broken spine, right? Like the dude's pretty tough, but there's just been been a lot of negativity around Derek Carr. I mean, he was still a three-time pro bowler. So the guy is talented. Bruce Arians, I think, could bring the best out of him. But again, I don't know if it, especially with some of the top tier talent when it comes around the league, I just don't know if he would necessarily get them all the way to the playoffs. You know, I got to say, I actually think they would be a playoff team with Derek in there because I look at the Tampa Bay roster, Mike Evans, OJ Howard, all the pieces they have around there. And I think that's better than anything that Derek Carr's had to play with in his career. So I think that could be a perfect match made in heaven type situation if he ended up in Tampa. But that requires John Gruden to trade him to another one of his former teams. They did draft Joe Burrow, number one overall in this situation. Okay, so we have three teams to still figure out. The Chargers, the Patriots, and the Steelers. I threw them on there for you, Dre, just because is it time to draft a quarterback? I guess we'll see. Absolutely. About- time to do anything to get another quarterback. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the Chargers first. Let's see who's going to end up in Los Angeles. Oh, out of Oregon, Justin Herbert is going on to Los Angeles. So he gets to stay on the West Coast. So that's a decent pairing geography-wise. Coming into the season, he was foreseen as a top 10 pick. He's still probably going to go in that range. There were some questions whether or not he could go number one. It was going to be hard for him to pass Tua, but no one expected Joe Burrow to pass him. In Los Angeles, do you think you have your quarterback for the next couple decades if you get Justin Herbert on that roster? Um, I don't know if Justin Herbert is necessarily the answer, right? So he does have a lot of this the you know tangibles that you would like to see right so he is six foot six that's pretty good for a quarterback right like you don't need a seven footer to be a quarterback but six foot six 237 that's pretty good touchdown to interception ratio right so he had 32 touchdowns this year six interceptions threw for 3471 yards in a college season that's pretty solid like all around Oregon is one of the the better teams now of course they don't necessarily always play some of the most skilled teams that we'd like to see so they're not always playing some of those SEC teams that we often equate to a NFL level sort of defense and style of play. But I do think Justin Herbert would be sufficeable. They would definitely still struggle the first year or two while Justin Herbert gets his pro legs under him. Though I do think in the long run, he, like I said, he may be sufficeable. I do not have them go into the playoffs though or anywhere close. Rookie quarterback, it's hard to necessarily elevate a roster, but it would be a shame because this is probably Los Angeles' best chance to compete with the pieces they currently have on that team. So having to punt for a couple of years with Justin Herbert would be a disappointment, but they are setting themselves up for long-term success drafting a rookie in the first round. Okay, our next team we're going to analyze here is going to be those New England Patriots. They've dominated the NFL for the last two decades. A lot of questions surrounding Tom Brady. Are they really going to bring him up back at age 44? Is it time to move on, find your quarterback of the future? Well, let's answer that question. And it is not, as they are going to keep Tom Brady in this situation. So, Cac, Brady, come back. Age 44. Tell me about these Patriots. Are they going back to the promised land? Are they going back to the Super Bowl? You go with what you know, right? Brady and Belichick, 
two peas in a pod. Also, cameras everywhere in that pod. Uh, but Brady's stats this past season weren't too bad. When you consider the following factors, you're wondering, wow, he has a lot to say because I actually like the Patriots. Don't hate. Motivate. The offensive line had injuries, okay, to vital players. The run game wasn't the best throughout the year. And uh, Brady has won six Super Bowl titles. That's just a fact. He's gone. I always joke that I watch one Super Bowl a year and the Patriots are in them. Didn't quite get that this year. But the team doesn't have a good backup plan. If he retires, if he leaves, there's not really a great plan B. So I think for me, this is a good fit. They would be smart to reach maybe a middle ground on what he's making and make an aggressive push during free agency toward winning a championship. But I don't think that the that the relationship is sour, that they're making it. I think Belichick and Brady have had too many years behind them, too many Super Bowls behind them, too much success behind them for it to quite end this way right now. So I see that. Uh, I'm not surprised that uh, the, the wheel has landed Brady. Continue with the Patriots. The guy had over 4,000 yards, 24 touchdowns, only eight interceptions, and uh, still throw the ball. So there were other er- areas where New England has struggled. I don't know if Tom Brady was the biggest problem. Well, the will gods have spoken and they have decided to keep Tom Brady in a Patriots uniform. He gets to retire with the franchise that brought him in. I I think it makes sense. Like you said, for the reasons, they don't really have a great backup solution. Stidham's not ready to step in. And I think Tom, in terms of his brand, staying in New England is something that not a lot of quarterbacks get to do. Finish their careers with the same franchise, especially when you've had such a Hall of Fame career like Brady has had. I think it just makes sense for them to keep him. Brady, do you have a take here? No, I don't have too much to add. A lot of what you're saying is almost spot on. And I actually think that the wheel got it right, even though we're doing this completely random right and we're generating random teams with random quarterbacks I really do think that that's probably what will happen is Tom Brady will re-sign um, with New England and like the CAC said they're probably going to be able to negotiate a lower salary than what a six-time Super Bowl winner could demand right like he could be the highest paid quarterback in the league though I don't think he's going to want that and time and time and again he has said no use that money go get me some pieces and I think that's exactly what they're going to do they're going to bring back Tom Brady he's going to take you know a mid range salary not you know a super low discount or anything like that but at the same time he's going to leave enough on the table that they can you know beef up the o-line if they need and get some skills players some good receivers some running backs stuff like that and and i think they'll make another good push being their division has gotten a little bit harder right but still i think that they'll make the playoff for all the reasons we said it just makes sense so dre we're gonna finish this segment with your team the pittsburgh steelers i'm just gonna end it strong here and we got cousins in pittsburgh let's go (laughs) we're gonna see who finishes with you guys or who starts their career there Mm mm-hmm And Teddy Bridgewater is a Pittsburgh Steeler. Dre, you happy? I am very happy. This is exactly what I wanted, actually. So Teddy Bridgewater is not necessarily that bad of a quarterback. We saw that he could suffice when he was in Minnesota. He was able to get him to the playoffs and up until the point that he got hurt. He did a great job holding the fort down for Drew Brees this past season when Drew Brees went out. I would be ecstatic if we got Teddy Bridgewater. I think he is a capable quarterback. He's shown that he can play at the highest level. And right now, I think if we continue to build our defense the way that it is, We have enough offensive weapons just to allow Teddy Bridgewater to do his thing and still be able to compete. So I am 100% happy with this. And I think that is the difference maker. And I think that the Steelers would have made the playoffs had they had Teddy Bridgewater this season. Do they get Ben in this situation? Unfortunately, no. So I don't know if it would realistically work out. I don't know if they would have the cap room to keep both of them. Ben is just a living legend in Pittsburgh. And I just don't think that there's any way that the organization would move off of Ben, even though realistically, they probably need to, right? Like we've seen their generation of quarterbacks all going downhill. And honestly, Tom Brady is going downhill. Eli Manning obviously retired. Phillip Rivers, we just talked about. And we don't think that he could elevate a team. And Big Ben honestly just keeps getting hurt and injured and talking about how much he wants to retire even though he keeps coming back and I think Big Ben at this point is more of a crutch than anything for the organization I hate saying that like I like Big Ben I appreciate all that he's done for the organization but I do think it's probably time for for him to retire I don't know how much left he has in the gas tank Jack, Teddy in Pittsburgh, what do you think? Teddy Bridgewater, the thing is, he had five starts, won them all, and he, he beat the Seahawks. So with that, as far as football is a little bit different than hockey, but five wins as a sample size, those five wins 
say a lot, I think. And I think Bridgewater would be as ready as I think as he could ever be to be a starting QB and have that potential. In terms of, is he an upgrade over an aging and ailing Roethlisberger? I'd like to say yes. And I think he'd be an upgrade for a few teams. And he has a very, he's one of the most accurate free agent QBs with a 65.2 career completion percentage, thanks ESPN. And um, I, I think that as far as sample sizes go for five games, he's won them all and he's won them handily. And I'm sure, yes, he had a bit of a supporting cast around him, but you know what? Uh, I think this guy's ready. I mean, I love it. I, it would make sense because the Steelers have to figure out what their quarterback situation is going to be like for the long-term future. I mean, Big Ben coming off a of Tommy John surgery, not a surgery you see a lot of times for a quarterback, more of a pitching injury, if anything. I have mentioned in the past, in terms of how that ligament works, I don't think it will be that much of a problem for Big Ben to come back from it. If anything, the throwing motion in baseball is what puts more of a stress on the elbow. A football throw is less demanding on that particular muscle so I think he could bounce back from it and you sometimes come back stronger off Tommy John so maybe Big Ben will have a bounce back season but in this situation Teddy Bridgewater and Pittsburgh I think they're back in the playoff okay let's see here before we move on but to see some quarterbacks that we didn't pick landing destinations for so some quarterbacks I still had on the board were Jacob Eason Jordan Love a couple of quarterbacks that are probably going to go in the lower rounds in the draft Drew Brees I wasn't sure if I should put him on the list just because I I think if he's not in New Orleans, he retires. And yeah, that's Ryan Tannehill's one of the big outliers. But worst case, he ends up in a backup situation. All right. So that does it for the NFL. Thank you, Jack. I appreciate you hanging in there on the football discussion. Sorry. You know it's, yeah, we know it's not like your main sport. But hey, we brought you on here to kind of educate some um, ignorant desert schlubs of the intricacies of hockey, the Face Off Hockey Podcast. So you guys have been doing it for, what, a few months now? Actually, uh, well, Gio and I have talked about it for a few months. And to give you a little bit of backstory on that, as I was saying to Julian before we went to air, we all know each other through school. I've known Mikey Lascaris since the elementary school days. Gio and I, we went to high school together, and then Gio and Mikey became best friends in university and were roommates in, uh, no, they met in high school and they were roommates in university. So I got hired by Fansided, which is a sports blog site, and Gio just happened to be working for the company. And when he found out I was hired, he sent me a DM. He slid into my DMs on Twitter, which isn't hard to do because I don't have that many followers. But he slid into my DMs, congratulated me, and I had done a hockey podcast back when I was in university. And I wanted to get that going again because I had a lot of fun. And Gio was on board. We did a few podcasts. And then Mike D wanted to join us. And I cannot say no to that face. So brought him on board. And it's been about a, a month now since the three of us have been doing this podcast, um, Face Off Hockey Pod or Face Off Puck Pod on Instagram and Twitter where you can find us. And that's been pretty much our, our backstory. And we've been doing it once a week. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. Gotcha. Like, what are some things that, I mean, you were worked, obviously, you have a background in broadcast as you mentioned but what were some things you weren't quite expecting getting into podcasting or some new challenges that you feel like you've had to overcome like getting it going well my old the old podcast i tried to do was called hoser hockey hour and that was about five years ago so the technology is a little different than it is today so that was a challenge but the, there hasn't been other than getting people to tune in consistently it's been smooth sailing with the guys i mean uh knock on wood it continues to be but the, my main challenge was to find people that were as passionate about the game of hockey or hacky uh i, I love i love you guys down in texas man i i, I want to be i want to go there so bad but uh i i my main concern was are there is there going to be anyone that's as passionate and as not to sound too full of myself but as informative about the sports as as me and geo and mike are just they're great they're fantastic their passion bleeds through the product the biggest hurdle really is to get more eyes and ears because we're also on spotify and apple podcasting to our our channel and uh we've had a few reviews so far and uh we just want to keep people coming back to uh every week to our to our podcast we want to build a community uh you guys were so nice enough uh, to reach out to get a collab going and they're really sorry I should say uh, that they cannot make it tonight Uh, but you're stuck with me and I am not eating any Timbits I ate those before I got on the air with you fellas so there's not gonna be any chewing sounds tonight (laughs) gotcha whatever you had to do to get that like little sugar rush to get you by obviously we are recording a little later here on the east coast or if you're listening to east coast time whatever time zone you're in it's a podcast you choose the time to listen you choose place wherever 
you could be listening to this yeah. car on the toilet. I don't give a shit. But we're very thankful for the opportunity that the Slump Buster <laughs> podcast has given us. And uh, we, we're excited to collaborating with you and keep this thing going. Yeah, absolutely. So, like, tell me. So, obviously, I mean, you're a huge enough hockey fan to start your own podcast on it. So, what was kind of like your first early memories that drew you to the sport? Obviously, we know, like, up in Canada, like, hockey is, like, king. Like, in the same way we, like, view football down here. Uh, my earliest hockey memories, uh, I would have to say I came out of the womb in a Montreal Canadiens jersey. That and the Montreal Canadian logo and the Toronto Blue Jay logo were two of the images I oh, I remembered almost by default. And it's, uh, it's it, the Blue Jay had it as a, as a hat I wear on every podcast. But the Montreal Canadiens, I just I just immersed myself in the sport. I played it. I played house league for many years. I squared off against Mikey Lascaris a few times. And uh, I've always loved uh, the history of the game. Can't pinpoint one specific memory, but I remember watching Don Cherry's Coach's Corner. Uh, he had a DVD every year. I'd get them in Christmas called Rock and Sock and Hockey. He came with a bunch of uh, highlights about the greatest uh, parts of the season. I would read Wayne Gretzky books uh, like crazy. I've read so many Wayne Gretzky books. I feel like I know him better than some of his peers. It sounds creepy when I say that out loud, but I, I've always I've always loved the Montreal Canadiens, and I'm now uh, I've grown an affinity to uh, the Vegas Golden Knights uh, because I was there when they got the team, and uh, my earliest memories are just watching Miracle, one of our favorite movies. Actually, it's all our three favorite movies, which is about the 1980 Miracle on Ice. Uh, my brother actually played in that arena in a hockey tournament and he won the best goaltender for that tournament in Lake Placid and just reading and watching anything I can get in hockey it was hockey and Harry Potter those were my religions and I grew up in a Catholic school board so like that tells it all I would say I'm glad you said you're a hockey historian we actually posted some hockey trivia just for you folks at Face Off so tell me what year was it that Wayne Gretzky set the single season scoring record the oh. options we have 81 82 mm-hmm. 83 or 84. No, 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 no. I see you typing. No, no cheating. Okay. <laughs> so he had 90. So we're talking about the 92 goals, correct? Yes. So we, the 92 goals. So that was 92 goals, 215 points. Run the years by me one more time. 81, 82, 83, or 84. I'm going to go with, mm, so he had four 200 point seasons and it was, there was two years of 200 point seasons. Then there was one year where he didn't make 200 and he had Another two years of 200 plus. I'm struggling between 83 and 84. But if I'm going to pick one, and I'm not typing because I'm showing you my hands, I'm going to go with, oh man, if I get this wrong, I'm going to be so pissed. 84. Oh, it's 83 or 82? 82. Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> like if it wasn't 84, I was like 83 or 82. But yeah, so he had 92 goals, 215 points. No one has gone close to that. And that's still the record. Sorry I disappointed you boys, though. Man, 82. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, we're expecting you just know, like, Wayne Gretzky's blood type. What do you like to eat for dinner before every game? Well, I could, I could actually answer that. He really? would have. I can. He had, uh, see, it's the conditioning in the 80s is much different than it is now. You can't get away with what he had back in the 80s when he was playing with the Edmonton Oilers for uh, nine seasons, well, 10 seasons if you count the one year in the WHA, he would have a couple of hot dogs and a Diet Coke for each game. And it would give him the, what he would say is it would give him the energy to keep going. And, and Glenn Sather, the coach and uh, sometimes GM of the team, would like to double or triple shift him. And, but he felt that he was getting the power from the hot dogs, a couple of hot dogs and a Diet Coke. That was the secret to Wayne Gretzky's uh, success. Can't do that now. <laughs> That is impressive that you know that. <laughs> like, I cannot tell you some of my favorite athletes meals. Not to, I mean, I know I got it wrong on the 1982 there, but I was, I've gone to the Hockey Hall of Fame a few times and I've had to sometimes correct some of the tour guides there because I love the Hockey Hall of Fame. I love those guys. I go there a lot. But there was this one tour guide that I was just like, uh, okay, he knew somebody. He knew his, his his uncle must have must have worked here or something. His his trivia wasn't uh, wasn't the best. I had to correct him on a couple of things. He didn't quite like that, but I only saw him that one time, so who cares? But uh, yeah, so Wayne Gretzky had a couple of hot dogs and a, a diet coke, and can't do that now in today's NHL. They they crucify you just for suggesting it. So. <laughs> 
See, like my favorite athlete, Barry Bonds, all he did was just, you know, his proper like serving of HGH to get him by in the morning and he was good to go. Uh, and it's, am- it's amazing how a head grows like triple the size and people still believe that he didn't take steroids. A head doesn't just grow like that without some, some extra HGH. I don't know. I mean, but, uh, seeing that man hit the ball like 600 yards into the ocean made up for yeah. it, but I'm biased. I mean, clearly I'm wearing a Giants hat on this podcast here, so I'm not probably not the it's best all good. to ask about Barry Bonds' legacy. Believe me, we did a show on it a couple weeks ago. Okay, gotcha. Good, so I'm glad you mentioned your favorite movie too, like Miracle. So like we're talking about like maybe bringing you guys on to do one of our episodes of Get Your Popcorn. So yeah, so we know Miracle's your guys' number one, but between the other two options I was going to mention there, so we have, you know, Mighty Ducks, and then we have Goon. Mm. Which is your favorite of those two? Oh, you know what? I can't speak for Mikey and Gio. I can't. Uh, but I have watched Goon. I did not quite like it. So I'm going to have to go with Mighty Ducks. And why I didn't like Goon. First of all, I was at the arena that they did the exterior shots in Halifax. I have actually was in the Canada Games, which is our junior Olympics. I've been in that arena. Looks nothing like that from the inside. So that kind of messed the movie up for me already. Second, I could not stand the female lead. And that pretty much kind of hindered the movie a little bit. I love the Mighty Ducks because it brings back that 90s nostalgia. Emilio Estevez. Martin Sheen's second, or I guess best, uh, most favorite son is in it. And it brings me back to to the 90s in a big, bad way. I will say, though, I think a better hockey movie than Goon, and again, I can't speak for Mikey and Gio. I didn't quite like it. Uh, It didn't hit the funny notes like I thought it would. Slapshot. Slapshot. Okay. I get to watch that, but I'll definitely give that line a, one a look not, based off your resume recommendation. Do not watch it with kids. It is not a family movie. It is hilarious. It is vulgar. They would not make a film like Slapshot today. Uh, it's very <laughs> vulgar, but it's very funny. And you know what? I, I, I watched it again this past summer, and I laugh my, my butt off. It's, it's, a, it's a funny film. Newman's great in it. He plays a player coach with this minor league hockey team, and the Hanson brothers are just fantastic. Now, Kak, I appreciate your disclaimer to not watch it with kids. I know I make a lot of dad jokes, but quite not yet at that tier yet. Andre can attest to that. Right, on, right Dre? Uh, I don't know, Juju. You might have a few kids running around out there that we don't know about. Shush. <laughs> this, <laughs> just, this, 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 this is a public record. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just hey, man, I, I worry about the same thing every day. So I'm joking. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I was going to mention a funny article I read. So, well, not so funny, but kind of funny. Also, Sean Weiss, one of the actors from the original Mighty Ducks. I don't know if you saw, he got arrested this week. Yes, I did see that. It's like, man, these child stars sometimes. I think he was trying to steal like a bunch of merchandise from a Rite Aid. From a Rite Aid? Like how far has your career fallen off if you're shoplifting from a Walgreens small convenience store? You you know what? A lot of these these actors, they they make a lot of money at cons, at conventions, and for signing and photo ops. I don't know. I don't know his situation. I can't speak about his life. But a lot of people, a lot of actors make make good money from that stuff. But, you know, there's always that. So whenever I, when I heard that, I was like, I'm sure he could have done some conventions. They have so many conventions every year. And it's just, it's, it's very unfortunate with how that went out, went down. Okay, so let's get into the actual sport here. So tell me, what is some of like your favorite like storylines that have come about this year? Tell me about like biggest surprise team. Educate us. Tell us what we need to know. So this kind of relates to a team that's close to Austin, Texas, where you're from, uh, Julian. Uh, A a big surprise, actually, this year was the amount of coaching firings. The last few years in the NHL, there haven't been that many coaches being fired in season. And it seemed like this year, almost half the league just got rid of old coaches. Now, there were reasons, teams not playing well. Two surprises that, and and actually, two surprise firings happened in the desert with coaches in hockey. The Well, I was going to say you're a Dallas Stars, but you haven't been to a Dallas Stars game yet. But the Dallas Stars, they were not doing well. The owner for the Dallas Stars was very vocal. He's always been vocal about his disappointment with his Stars. But the Stars were picking it up. They were picking it up. They were doing well. They were starting, they were at the bottom at the beginning of the season. They were in a playoff spot. And then they decided 
dismissed their coach in December for what they called inappropriate conduct. Now, it took a few weeks for the news to come out that it was actually alcohol abuse uh, that the coach, Jim Montgomery, uh, the former coach, Jim Montgomery, was suffering from alcohol abuse and that he has been going into rehab. And I haven't really got an update on how he's been doing, but he has been, he has been admitted to rehab and he's taking the proper precautions to get back into the game. The most surprising coaching firing was my second favorite team and one of my favorite cities ever, the Vegas Golden Knights firing their coach, Gerard Gallant, uh, after a four-game losing streak. Didn't make a lot of sense at the time. Still doesn't. We still can't wrap our heads around it. We know that San Jose let their coach, uh, let one of their former coaches go and that GM really liked that coach. Coach's name was Pete DeBoer. But Gerard Gallant took an expansion team, a team with castaways and expendable players, and with the small, uh, with the lowest salary in 2017 took them to the Stanley Cup finals and then uh, they make the playoffs last year and I think a, a bad couple of calls that didn't go their way put them in a position where they ended up losing in seven games to the San Jose Sharks then comes this year they have a great team stars are aligning they kind of hit a rough skid with a four game losing streak and Gerard Gallant gets fired and now watch every team try to get Gerard Gallant services because he is an amazing coach. I've watched this guy when he was assistant coach with uh, the Montreal Canadiens. The players buy in, they dial in for whatever reason. There were rumors going around that maybe he wanted too much money to resign in Vegas, but he did everything and more that was expected of him. So if there was a coach to ask for such a raise, it would have been that guy. So I, in terms of the biggest surprise, the biggest surprise would have been, I think, the coaching firing, at least for me. I can't speak for Mikey and Gio, but I think we were all kind of sideswiped with, or, you know, Gerard Gallant. He was the last coach that we thought that was going to get fired. So I would say that that, was, that would have been one of the top stories and the biggest surprises of the year. Yeah, no, I mean, to fire a coach after leading you to the finals just a couple years prior, that's a bold move that a lot of franchises, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense when they do it. Like, I remember one of the things I always remember as a Niners fan is whenever we cut bait on Jim Harbaugh after a couple years after taking us to the Super Bowl. It doesn't make a lot of sense when it comes down to it. You think that being in the finals brings you at least maybe a couple years more of equity, especially when that's you mentioned, what I said. Yeah, especially when you mentioned it's an expansion franchise. The players loved them. Everyone pretty much, any any player that has ever dealt with him has loved him no one's really said anything bad about him that i have i've looked into because believe me when this happened i did a deep dive in the internet and i couldn't find any dirt on him so it's just an unfortunate situation vegas they have a wild card spot in the playoffs right now but they're in a division that is so tight that you lose two or three games in a row and you're on the outside looking in and then some so i'm keeping my eye on vegas seeing what happens quite frankly i don't see how it improved the team but you know what new general manager he makes the decision so there you have it right so geo he was kind enough to get us some power rankings for the slumpbuster.com so yes. i think probably the best way of going about this is we're going to start from the bottom up and you kind of like tell me some of your biggest agreements disagreements with like where he currently has these teams and where you kind of like see these teams like shifting one of the big right. things i joked about with you in the pre-show too is like one of my more hockey oriented friends mentioned this is definitely a list made by a canadian here <laughs> hey Hey. hey, you're pitting me against my buddy here. But now this list, the thing is, hockey is always in a state of flux. It's it's always changing. Teams go on a tear and then they lose 10 straight. So it's it's very hard to gauge this. I'm looking at his list, which was done about a week ago. There are some changes. There's also been a lot of big time injuries. So I'm going to go through the bottom and see and tell you if they stay or if they don't. At the time, I don't necessarily disagree with Geo's takes, but I will go down the list and, and tell you my thoughts on them. So we're going to start at number 31, Detroit. Love the city. I had such a great time on St. Patty's weekend. They're at 31. They're going to stay at 31 because right now they're in a bit of a, 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 a situation where they're not just, you know, tearing it down. They're tearing it down, blowing it up. They're, they have 32 points this season, only 14 wins. It's it's a very rough year. It's going to be a rough couple of years for Detroit. Again, me and Gio, we love the city, but the hockey team is in a bit of a, a situation right now where it's going to be in legendary suckitude for at least, I'd say, two more seasons. So I agree with Gio there. Coming in at 30, uh, Gio has Los Angeles. They're the last place team in the Western Conference. They have, I think, one more point. Let me just double check. I think they have one more point than Detroit. Or no, they have 11 more points than Detroit as we're speaking. They're not getting better anytime soon. That stays. New Jersey, 
Now, in terms of surprises, the New Jersey Devils, me and Gio thought that they were going to be at the bottom. A lot of hockey pundits in Canada disappointed. They had New Jersey ranked higher because they made a few moves. I didn't think that the moves necessarily made them a better team. They got, uh, I'm sure you guys have heard of P.K. Subban. I, you know, I, I get I really can't. Like I said, like we are just dead, like zero, like hockey oh, knowledge. Like we okay. literally have like, okay. So give you an idea on the New Mexico hockey scene. We had yeah. the Scorpions, right, Dre? It was the Scorpions. And I can't even, I don't even think that they were professional. I think they were semi-pro. No, no they were that's a minor, 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 minor team. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So you guys, okay. So they got a few couple of like players that were supposed to do well. I thought that there was this one player called PK Subban. I get, sometimes a little bit of shade because I think he's really overrated and the fact that New Jersey is at the bottom of the league solidifies my point. He has them at third last in his power rankings. Uh, I, I agree with him there. They're three points better than at 28. He has the Ottawa Senators. Ottawa is the capital of Canada and there again, uh, they have an owner that um, he's only bright if you throw a lamp at him. So the, the owner has made it very difficult for the Ottawa Senators to get top tier talent uh, via free agency so they have to go through the draft. He has Ottawa at 28, Anaheim at 27. There, That's another team that has just not been uh, playing to expectations. I'm just going to go through this quickly. Uh, Buffalo, actually, Gio, Mikey thought, Gio and Mikey thought that Buffalo was going to do well uh, this season, contend for a playoff spot. I respectfully disagreed, and it doesn't look like that Buffalo is going to make the playoffs the way that they have been playing lately. They have way too many teams to jump over. I don't think it's going to happen. San Jose was a surprising team uh, in the sense that they just suck right now, and it was not supposed to be this way. If you talk to anyone in hockey, San Jose was one of those teams that they've been in the playoffs every year. They kept the core intact. Uh, it just it didn't work out for them. Their goalie hasn't been playing like himself for the past two seasons now, so no idea what's going on there. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, my my baseline with San Jose as you know a Niners Giants fan is I am familiar with the team very well a lot of the Bay Area reporters I follow definitely talk some sharks and I do yeah. I'm familiar with the fact they're not supposed to be at the bottom of these tiers they're supposed to be in the playoffs choking in typical shark fashion right it's just you know what it just they lost Joe Pavelski this offseason who was their captain for a couple of years and I was one of my favorite players on the team so that had some effect they gave a lot of money to Eric Carlson who was at the defenseman who played very very well these last few years but he's had a lot of injuries and I don't think he's fully recovered from those injuries but he's taking a large a large portion of the cap so with San Jose I didn't see it coming no many people saw it coming this wasn't like a New Jersey situation where you know there was like oh they might be good people thought that San Jose was gonna still make it to the playoffs and the fact that they're so far down this list uh, is a surprise and a disappointment to me because their core on paper is supposed to work but it just hasn't been and And it's going to be interesting to see what San Jose, how they go from here. Their general manager was also the president. He's had his president powers kind of rescinded. He has less uh, power on the business side. So we'll see what happens at San Jose. Coming in at 24, 23, and 22, we have uh, Minnesota, Winnipeg, New York. Winnipeg, you know what? They've had three of their defensemen have been gone. It's kind of been drama in the peg, as we say here in Canada. Minnesota, we knew they weren't going to do anything. Winnipeg, they have been doing so well the last couple of years. For whatever reason, they lost their three right-handed defensemen who have been great. Their best player being Dustin Bufflin. He's he, There's a lot of drama considering the, where Bufflin is. And we talked about it at our podcast actually this week or the week before we definitely addressed what was going on with Dustin Bufflin and he wants to leave Winnipeg coming in at 22 he has New York New York Rangers they've kind of turned around uh, a little quickly people expected them to not do as well I mean they don't have a playoff spot and they're not probably not going to make the playoffs but they've they got a few pieces with youth that I think in a few years they're going to be a force Montreal <laughs> My favorite team, he has them at 21. And now that their captain is injured, I don't disagree with that now. Uh, If you talked to me two days ago, I would have disagreed with where he has them. They've lost a couple of very meaningful games uh, the last couple of days. And they've lost their best defenseman and their captain. So, you know what? I keep them down there as well. Arizona Coyotes at number 20. This was a team that, they're a bit of an enigma. They exceeded expectations early in the season. They went and they traded for a center in Taylor Hall, who's a really good player, but they haven't been keeping up with the rest of their division. They, Like I said, they're in a division with uh, where it's very tight. Uh, Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary. It's a very tight division. And unfortunately, Vancouver was doing well, then they weren't doing well, and then they became great. 
So Arizona kind of gets lost in the shuffle there. Coming in at uh, 19, he has the Vegas Golden Knights. I'd say, yep, that's a great place to put them. Now, this is where the power rankings kind of, this is where you can, it's a couple of weeks, it's been about a week, but you can kind of see how where it's dated a little bit, just considering where the standings are. And this is not a geo fault. It's just, it's the way that, hockey just quickly moves the Chicago Blackhawks he had at 18 I probably have them a little lower now just because they've been playing 500 hockey sub 500 hockey kind of hard to gauge where they're going to finish the season there's still people that think that they might squeak in the playoffs but they have to jump over Winnipeg Arizona Vegas and they also have to pass over Nashville who's at 17 which if I'm going to compare the rosters, I think that Nashville is just a little bit stronger. Chicago has a bite, but not as big as a bite as the Nashville Predators. Coming in at 16, he has the Carolina Hurricanes. They don't have a wild card spot as of today, but again, that can change. Carolina has a great player in Sebastian Aho, and they have Justin Williams coming back, who was their captain last year, and their lightning rod. Carolina at 16, I agree with that. He has Philadelphia Flyers, Philly. At 15, there are a couple of points ahead of Carolina. They're good. They're a good team. I could see them making the playoffs. I don't could quite see them making that much of a run. Uh, in terms of what's happening this season with the Philadelphia Flyers, I think that that is a great spot to put them. Middle of the pack. Not quite. 14 or 13 but again if you compare where he has number 14 the calgary flames they've been picking it up recently they're in a very tight division they're a team that you want to see some fights watch their games against the edmonton oilers because i tell you their rivalry with the edmonton oilers is crazy the last couple of weeks they've been squaring off and we've had goalie fights We've had players running at each other. It's been absolutely mayhem. He has your Dallas Stars at number 13. I can agree with that because Dallas has a playoff spot right now in the Central Division. Uh, I don't want to go too long, but uh, Dallas, uh, they, they're picking it up after what seemed to be a season that was kind of condemned as lost early out of the gate. But they picked it up and, you know, the owner just has to keep calling them, uh, what do they call them? Can we swear on this show? Yeah, go for it. I don't care. We have like a half-naked like woman is okay, her so- icon. <laughs> I always have to ask. Uh, he called them fucking horse shit last year, and he's been very vocal, so usually gets the players going. I, I'd say that they're good at number 13, or around there. He has the Edmonton Oilers at number 12. Now that, I think, is going to change because they just lost Connor McDavid for the next two to three weeks, maybe more. Connor McDavid is the best player I think, in the National Hockey League. I mean, he'd be as close to a modern-day Wayne Gretzky as you make it. Uh, Edmonton's going to have to really test their depth uh, without Connor McDavid. That might change in the coming weeks, so I'm going to keep my eye out for that. Coming in at number 11, the Vancouver Canucks. They, again, like I said, nobody was really sure what to make of these guys. People, uh, Vancouver fans, were calling for the general manager's head. Uh, Hashtag fire Benning. Uh, Jim Benning is their general manager. It was trending across the nation, across Canada. It's trending in Canada, not just Vancouver. But the Canucks could have and now they're leading the division. But again, they're in that division where you lose a couple of games, you could be outside the playoff race. They got to keep it up, but they got to, you know, I think that's a good spot for them. Coming in at number 10, the center of everything hockey, the Toronto Maple Leafs, our hometown. <laughs> I have a lot to say about this team. They have a lot of offensive weapons. Their goaltending, their their goaltender, who has been their MVP of the season, has been out recently, but they got a backup in Jack Campbell, who they traded for recently, who's been doing the best he can and is doing a good job but their defense is where everyone worries Toronto has been asking for competent defensemen for the last two, three seasons, it sounds, and they just haven't really addressed those needs yet. It's, there's always a problem with the defensemen. They have one of the worst defensemen ever in the league, being Cody CC. I don't know how he makes $4.5 million. It astounds me. I have seen a few Toronto games live in stadium, and it's, if you're a hockey fan, and if you think it's something to watch him in, on the TV screen, watching him live is even worse. So Toronto stays, I think, at number 10. They just have a lot of holes on their defense that kind of are hindering them and holding them back from being the contender that everyone in the media has been saying. Now, he has Columbus at number nine. At the time, I could see where Geo was coming from, but they have two key injuries, uh, the Columbus Blue Jackets, in Seth Jones, their best player and defenseman, and one of their best forwards in Cam Atkinson. I could see that possibly dropping. They have overachieved so far because they had a lot of great players last year that left via free agency. The fact that they're even in this wildcard spot is close to a miracle for them as you can make it, but again, you have two key components that are out for a long time. So if anyone in the top 10 is going to drop down significantly, my 
best bet would be the Columbus Blue Jackets. Coming in at number eight, he has the New York Islanders. They're just, you know what? They play like a committee. They play a committee. There's not one player that really stands out as an A-lister. They have one of the best coaches in the National Hockey League in Barry Trotz, and they're playing as a unit, and they're staying that way. So kudos to the New York Islander fans. Um, if they end up watching a game live, they can... <laughs> Question See on for that. themselves. Uh, we know like a star talent like in the NBA can carry a roster to a championship. Do you think that a hockey team is better constructed like um, as much depth as possible? Or do you think that a star talent is probably the best way to formulate a starting unit? That is a very good question. Here's how I'm going to answer it. It depends on who the manager is of the team is. You look at Connor McDavid and he plays for the Edmonton Oilers and he's been the best player for the last couple of years, uh, arguably. He has been plagued by horrible management throughout his career. Yes, the Edmonton Oilers went and got a decent general manager and they fired the, the front office staff this past season. But if you look at the Edmonton Oilers last year and the year before that and the year before that, they had two weapons. They had Connor McDavid, they had Leon Dreisaitl, two of the best players in the National Hockey League. They could not surround them with the talent or the proper coaching, really, for them to flourish. Now, that has changed. Again, we have a salary cap where that kind of, it's a hard salary cap, so that tends to be kind of a problem when signing these big free agents because you get a, a huge portion of that cap committed to that player. Toronto has that problem where they have three players in Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, and John Tavares that are making over 10 million annually a year uh, in, a, in a cap that is around 81 million. So that you're, you're tied 30, 30 plus million in three players. That can become a problem, which is why the defense is suffering in Toronto. You look at the St. Louis Blues this past year, they're the defending Stanley Cup champions. In terms of a star power, like if you're talking like a Kawhi Leonard or a LeBron James in the NBA, the St. Louis Blues don't quite have that. They have good players, don't get me wrong, in Alex Bertangelo, Ryan O'Reilly, Jordan Bennington, who came out of nowhere last year and became a good goaltender for them. They have a lot of good pieces that don't generate a lot of cap hell, as what we call. They have been playing it well. If you look at a team like the Tampa Bay Lightning, they have A-list talent, but what happens is they, the stars on the Tampa Bay Lightning, so like Nikita Kucherov, Steven Stamkos, Victor Hedman, Andre Vasilevsky, those types of players have taken price cuts and they haven't taken up or eaten as much of the cap as they could in the open market. Now, Tampa Bay, the tax situation compared to, to the Toronto Maple Leafs situation is a little different, that they can afford to shed a little bit of their cap hit uh, and still take home that amount of money. But Toronto, they get taxed here a lot. So, which is why they're arguably their cap hit is so high. But my argument is you play for the Toronto Maple Leafs, you're going to make that stuff on endorsements anyway. So that's been my beef with the Toronto big three, as it were is because they can make this money in endorsements in Toronto. You're playing in the hockey mecca of the, probably the world. They don't really need that amount of money in their cap hit. That's different. In terms of getting like that one superstar player, in hockey, it's a little different because there's more moving pieces. In basketball, you have your starters, you have your relievers. In hockey, you have to roll four lines of forwards, three lines of defensemen, and you have a main goaltender and a backup goaltender. A lot of moving parts. So if you have the best player in the world, and Edmonton has proven this with Connor McDavid, and he does, bad general managers can hinder that. Now you look at the Pittsburgh Penguins with Sidney Crosby. Well, he has a, also, he has, they, they've been able to, to put great pieces around him that he can win multiple cups in the form of, of Getty Malkin and Phil Kessel when he was there, Chris Letang, Matt Murray, who's their goaltender. They've been able to put those amount of places. It depends on how much of the cap that your star player wants to take in. And unfortunately, Edmonton was in a situation where they had two players that were very, very good. They just couldn't surround them. And I think that was what Boston Bruins last year and what St. Louis last year and what they've been continuing to do, the St. Louis Blues and the Boston Bruins, is have players that are great take less money so they can have an all-around better team. And that is why, if you look at the Toronto Maple Leaf situation, they can't go out and do anything really because they're so tight against the cap it's hard for them to make moves. They had to sacrifice a first-round pick uh, this last summer to make room for Mitch Marner's extension. Uh, they had to move a, a contract, uh, Patrick Marlowe's contract, that was around $6 million, just to make room to re-sign Mitch Marner. So it gets a little dicey there. If you look at the Colorado Avalanche, to bring this back to the power rankings, they have a lot of elite talent right now. But again, they have a lot of players that are really, really good who you could say are A-listers, but they are taking less money. So there, that 
creates a lot of opportunity for the, uh, for the Colorado Avalanche to go and get more compatible, more competent players. So in the form, like Nathan McKinnon, who's their star player, said that he will take mo- less money if it includes winning more. Gabriel Landeskog has taken less money. Rantanen has taken a large amount of money, but if he was to go in the open market, my contention is, is he would get more. In answering your question, it would depend on who the general manager is and what is the situation around him that star player can utilize his talent in the highest capacity possible. Oh, okay. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it definitely, it definitely does. So you're saying it just, you have to build out that depth a little bit more than you would. Yeah. You, you can't be led to a championship by just that one guy. I can brought it back to NBA at one point, but okay. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Well, and, and, and just to stick to your Toronto, uh, to your NBA analogy, the Toronto Raptors, I think is the first time where it's strictly coaching with Nick Nurse. They have done such a great job. I mean, they Kawhi Leonard left. I knew it was going to happen, but we had hope. Kawhi Leonard left and the Raptors have been playing as a unit. They've been kind of playing the way that Columbus has been playing. Now, the Raptors have had injuries, but they've, they've kept it in such a structure that they're hard to defend against. So in yeah. saying that, it, dep- it, it depends on a variety of factors, but you can't just have one all-star talent and think, okay, that's it, finals, here we go. <laughs> That's just not the case in hockey, unfortunately. Shout out to Spicy P, a fellow New Mexico State Aggie, so alumni. <laughs> yeah, Pascal Siakam, he's a beauty. It's, it's refreshing. In Toronto, we have this thing where we were always afraid that our stars would leave. Carter did it. Bosch did it. Uh, if you look at baseball, Roy Halladay, rest in peace, uh, he left. We've always been worried about our stars leaving. And now we have stars that, I mean, Kawhi Leonard aside, that want to stay. And it seems like Pascal Siakam wants to stay. And I hope we can keep him. Uh, he was drafted and through our system and Masai Ujiri found him. And the fact that he's only been playing basketball for like seven years is astounding. They've done quite the job there with the Raptors. So if you mm-hmm. do you want me to continue just finishing? Yeah, the, yeah. Uh, We're down to the final six here. So you passed Colorado. Sure. So let's go into Florida Panthers. Tell me. Okay, Florida Panthers. Uh, they've had a bit of a regression uh, the last week or so. So I think having them at six at the time was probably a good move. But that is kind of, I'd have them lower. I would probably have them in the 13, 14, 15 category right now, given where they are in the standings. Pittsburgh, so the top four or the top five, I actually would keep these picks the way they are. Tampa Bay, maybe I, no, you know what? Uh, uh, No, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to double down on this. Pittsburgh at number five, they just made a trade, a significant trade a couple of days ago for a depth winger in uh, Jason Zucker. Pittsburgh, uh, they had a lot of, uh, they had a big injury to Sidney Crosby, who missed a good portion of the season, but they've been able to do all right. Uh, You have Boston at number four, the Boston Bruins. I hate that team. We hate that team. If you listen to our podcast, we can rant about that team till the end of time. Unfortunately for us, they're a good hockey team and they know how to manage and structure their team. Having them at number four, I say, fine. I'm not happy about it, but fine. I'll say this. <sighs> a bit of a, so obviously I haven't made my allegiances to any particular team. So I'm a, a Giants and Niners fan, my baseball and mm. football. I'm a Boston Celtics fan. So I, I have often thought about evening it out and just name declaring the Bruins my NHL team. Now give me the argument for not doing that. They're jerks. <laughs> they're, they're, they're jerks. They're such a dirty team. I don't even have Timbits to stressy. They're such a, oh, I, I hate Brad Marchand. He's such a dirty player. He's such a rat, but man, is he good in the, with, with his stick. Whether it's scoring goals or spearing or hitting a guy's testes when he's not looking. Zdeno Char is a dirty player. Look, if you want to be a Boston fan, I'm not going to hold that against you. I'll still talk to you but you know what yeah and that's the problem that's that that's what makes it they're good but you hate them because they are so dirty and the thing is and i have a conspiracy theory running on the show where i think because the owner of the boston bruins is so high up in the nhl board of governors that they get away with a lot and you know what they do get away with a lot and that's been part of the problem but also they're very good so you can't say it's just because that the refs are turning a blind eye every now. So they are a good hockey team. If you want to be a Bruins fan, fine. <laughs> That's fine. I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to point you one way or the other. Okay. If you want to be a Bruins fan, be a Bruins fan. I'm just not going to be happy about it, but that's okay. Dre, we haven't heard from you in a while. Do you want to declare your allegiances to a fanhood? Uh, I mean, maybe I'll just go with LA, right? Like that's 
where most of my teams reside, except for the Pittsburgh Steelers, right? That just happened to be a one-off. So I guess I will go with LA. That's the Kings, right? I'll say this on the bright side. They, yeah, they <laughs> suck. So See? no one's going to accuse you of being a bandwagon. Huh? I am, I am not a bandwagoner. It is just happens to be LA and I will take, I will take the LA Kings, no matter how bad that they are. Okay. I, I just fell. I just fell in love with Dre right now. That's that's what I like to hear. See, exactly. This is why the cat and I we get along so well. Word up. <laughs> he Word is up, a beautiful Dre. chocolate man. Oh, I was like, wait, me? No, <laughs> Dre. Yeah. <laughs> I was talking no, about me for a second. No, not not the right complaint. No, right. <laughs> yeah, but uh, no, Dre. I respect that. I respect that. I've been in LA. I've I, I've seen the Kings. They're, you're gonna you're gonna be in a bit of a rough part. If you went with Pittsburgh, I mean, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have said much either. Although Crosby's a whiny baby, but you know, what are you gonna do when you're one of the best players in the league? I do like the Penguins, right? And I'll I'll definitely root for them every now and again. But if it has to come to picking my favorite, I'll stick with the Kings since that's the team I went with. And uh, even though they'll suck, so nobody will accuse me of being a bandwagoner. You're the anti-bandwagon. Way to go, Dre. Way to stick it. Ex- exactly, uh, sticking it to him. So, so, Julian, you want to change your, your your team, or you're gonna you're gonna double down on Boston? Well, here's the thing. The only like team I oh, think God. would be logical is I. Yes, I could go geography based and go with the Dallas Stars here, but that would also require me. So I'll say this. So I hate the Cowboys. If you've listened to the show in the past, you know I hate the Cowboys. So like that would involve me supporting a Dallas-based sports organization. That's a tough right. like thing for me to really make my allegiances to. I know gotcha. I'm only a couple hours away from them, but I'll just say it out loud, man. Ah, Dallas not not my thing. So with that said, like yeah. my other my remaining two options there is I could go San Jose because match up with the other Bay Area teams I have. Like I said, yeah. it's it's a matter of balancing out, right? To Boston, to Bay Area, in New Mexico, in that like juicy middle right there. That's why I'm kind of like thinking, but you did make some compelling arguments. I get mad just thinking about them. But hey, you know what? If you ever come to Toronto, I'm just warning you now, if you're wearing a Bruins shirt, I'm not going to be the only one that's going to be booing you on the streets. I'll walk beside you. I'll acknowledge that we know each other, but I might be leading that brigade. Dude, I mean, savage. But, you know, it's funny because you mentioned as far as football goes, you have allegiances to New England Patriots. I mean, I guess you can yeah, do all three. That's clearly that's clearly a Brady thing. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. I, so, I know. I, I, get, I get that. I get that. But it's clearly a Brady thing. He's been my favorite NFL player since I've been – watching the sports so that was me bandwagoning 10 years ago so whatever it is so uh i like brady uh yes they cheat i'm not gonna deny it they've cheated but i i like i like tb man i don't know uh, I can't explain it, but I like TB. But I also, you know, once he retires, I'm probably going to probably, I like Chicago as well. So when he's gone, when Brady's gone from New England, whenever that is, uh, I might, you know, switch my gears to Chicago. He's just going like to be in his age 60 season, just still playing with them, just gets Dude. tackled, turns into a cloud of dust. <laughs> Go with what you know, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm just to round out the, uh, the last three picks that he has, uh, that that Gio has on his uh, little power ranking list there. St. Louis, the defending Stanley Cup champions, he has them at number three. That's a good, that, you know what, that that stays. I think that sticks this week. They're definitely, the, they have the most points in the Western Conference, but they are they don't have the amount of points that second place Tampa Bay does. Tampa Bay kind of meandered a little bit. Uh, people were worrying about Tampa Bay, but uh, we at the podcast thought it was only a matter of time before Tampa Bay picks up. They were way too good to not be. They have a lot of star power, a lot of firepower that took less money, and uh, they kind of of hit a, a bump in the road last year when they were swept by the Columbus Blue Jackets. But before the playoffs happened, they actually, the owner took had them take the plane to party it up a little bit because they had the most wins in the NHL ever, I think. They had the most points uh, of all time for an NHL team. And the owner was like, take the jet, do whatever. They did, and then they sucked in the playoffs. So hoping that that doesn't happen again, if I'm a Tampa Bay fan. The Washington Capitals, he has them at number one. I know I said earlier that I would double down with that top five. Looking at this, I maybe Boston and Washington, they kind of move around a little bit. Washington, Alexander Ovechkin, he's on He's on a tear this year. He's making a, I don't know if he's done it already, but he's about to get or hover around 700 goals of all time. So he's moving all time uh, on the list of all time scorers. And there is talk that he might be, and by the end of his career, have more goals than Wayne Gretzky. He's only, if he has 700 now, he'd only be 157 away. How no. old is he? Uh, he's about 34. Because Alexander Ovechkin, that's definitely been a name that's circled around for 
like at least this last decade here. So uh, he's in his mid thirties. Oh, sorry, I did the math wrong. I did the math wrong with uh, the goals. He would have if he had seven hundred goals now, he'd have one hundred ninety four to go, and he's been averaging about fifty goals, forty goals a season. So he he could very well make it. But he, again, he's in his mid thirties. But again, he's just going on a tear. So it's hard to tell uh, how much longer he wants to play. I know he's been gunning for it, so maybe it does happen. Wayne Gretzky has eight hundred ninety four goals, so it's gonna be weird if Ovechkin surpasses it after all these years because Gretzky had that mantle since he retired in 1999 so that's gonna be crazy that uh rounds up geo's power rankings there it's gonna it shifts a little bit because it's you know it's about Mm -hmm. more than a week old but the main components like where they're situated like no one would be going all the way down to the bottom or all the way to the top so the range is 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 accurate it's just exactly where you want to put these guys is a little different so thank you for hearing me out on that (laughs) yeah i know i went a little bit longer but uh i'm sorry i'm canadian i say sorry trying to figure out my typifies (laughs) <laughs> you definitely had a lot to work through there but i mean hey it's good for our listeners because like i said this has just been a sport that just been totally just off on the back burner because like none of us know how to properly represent it here and with that said i guess i was going to just like ask you what are some things that you think the hockey could do to elevate itself in the sports hierarchy? It's definitely top four, but like you have this void right now. So the NBA ratings have been down. The MLB ratings have been down. So there's opportunity there to capture a new generation. I think it's mm. just going to be a matter of can hockey do it. I feel like one of the biggest things I notice is exposure because when you have playoff games that are currently on the NHL network, which not a lot of people necessarily own, that's a problem. That is a problem. I kind of went off on the referees this week. As I say, every week I go off on the referees, but I think that's a problem why people are getting taken out of hockey. With your point about deep playoff runs, I think that is a huge motivation for getting people in the Sunbelt teams. Uh, For example, like the Arizona Coyotes, the Nashville Predators, those kinds of teams, having them competitive and make deep playoff runs keeps fans engaged and brings in new fans. So I think the NHL, the problem with the NHL is there's two things. One is the grass, grassroots level. It's way too expensive to enroll your kid in hockey. It's just the prices for equipment and ice time. Uh, I can't speak for the Americans when it comes to ice time, but in Canada and where we live in the greater Toronto area, it's just absurd. I thought it was expensive when I played. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy, the prices for equipment nowadays. I don't know how people do it without going in debt. We have programs in place in Canada for low-income families to have their kids play hockey it's just it's just ridiculous there are so many great talented athletes when i played in elementary school that if they had the money they probably would have played rep hockey so that would have been traveling hockey for the nhl to take advantage of this they have to do things maybe outside the convention hockey is a is a sport that's rich in tradition and the fact is they don't have a lot of personalities with the players i mean they have talented players but they don't have the personalities They don't have, in basketball and football, you have your personalities like Richard Sherman in the NFL. You don't have anybody like that in the National Hockey League. You have P.K. Subban, which you guys actually, I don't know, Dre, do you know who P.K. Subban is? Uh, To be honest, no, I do not. (laughs) Okay, so there you go. So our loudest, so in in terms of a player and a, a personality, I just named you our biggest one, and you guys don't even know about it. And that's not on you. I'm just, that's a fact. That's a problem. When I was in Los Angeles a few years ago, the Los Angeles Kings were making their Stanley Cup run. Nobody knew that the Los Angeles Kings had just come down, had come back from 3-0 in the series to beat the San Jose Sharks. Nobody knew it. Nobody knew it. I could. I, I went all around Los Angeles to find a Los Angeles Kings hat. I couldn't find it anywhere. People were like, this is the Los Angeles Kings. I said, no, this says Los Angeles, but not the Los Angeles Kings. That started to shift a little bit once they started winning the Cups. When they were going on that tear, nobody really heard of them. But by the end of the, of the Stanley Cup run, a lot of people knew who they were. So to have those teams be competitive, that's a big push. The Vegas Golden Knights, I don't think would be as popular as they are now had they not gone to the Stanley Cup Finals and had that miracle season that they had. I was in Vegas when they initially got the team. I was there in the summer that they got the team and they had just released the logo and they just gotten their original roster. Only two places were selling Las Vegas Golden Knights merchandise. It was the T-Mobile Arena, which was my first stop. That's how Canadian I am. I went to the arena first. Actually, I went there twice. Now that I think about it, I went there twice. And there was a little shop uh, in the middle of the strip in like one of those like mall inside 
kind of thingies. Nowhere else were they selling Vegas Golden Knights stuff. Those were only two places. And I was there in Vegas for a whole week and I couldn't find anything other than those two places. So the arena and one either and one shop somewhere in the MGM kind of area. But then they went on winning streak. They kept playing games. They were and then more and more people started picking up on it. And then they went to the playoffs, they went to the finals, and you had people standing outside watching the game on the jumbo truck because they were competitive. Had Vegas been one of those teams that were in the middle of the road, not doing well, they might not have been as popular. But I think a big part of Las Vegas's success is because of that. Thank you, Gerard Gallant. Sorry we didn't keep you long enough for a presidential term, but hey, you know what? You general manager, what are you going to do? So that's why I think that that the NHL, they have an opportunity. The thing is, some of the decisions they make in-house are dumb, and that has to do with officiating and stuff like that. But to keep them in the public eye, these desert teams or these Sunbelt teams, like your Tampa Bay Lightning, like your, uh, I guess, your LA Kings, your San Jose Sharks, and your, your Nashville Predators, keep those teams competitive. Because also, Nashville was on the brink of, of leading the NHL. People forget that. A few years ago, they made the Stanley Cup final. But if you rewind the clock back to like 2010 or even 2007, in terms of teams that were getting relocated, Nashville was one of the top of the lists. Well, they made the finals. They have Carrie Underwood's husband playing. Gets people generating. Gets people interested. So, by the way, my Mike Fisher is a beauty. Anyway, but they got people interested. And now I see so I, I couldn't, I, I'm shocked at what Smashville has become. They had a couple fans. The, the fact that Nashville is as popular as they are now, nobody, if I, if, if someone were to tell me 10 years ago that that was going to happen, I would have been like, you're crazy. Because they just, they've, they've been on the brink of relocating so many times. It was the Atlanta Thrashers who became the Winnipeg Jets and Nashville and even Arizona that were always the top three and teams that were going to be moved. And now you look at Nashville and they're, they're having, they're, they're healthy. Uh, financially, they have great attendance. Another bachelorette, uh, Hannah Ann, uh, is 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 there. So it's like it, it's crazy. I gotta stop watching the Bachelorette. I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, it's, I'm it's fine. Uh, my. <laughs> I need the I need that info as well. One of my coworkers, she tries to feed me as much bachelor knowledge as she can, which is fantastic. It's like the benefit of being single and gain all the bachelor knowledge. So yay, yay me. <laughs> the funny thing is, I've been on two reality shows up here in Canada, so I feel worse about myself because I know how this stuff happens. Really? I've been there. Yeah, they're not. I mean, they're not as big as the Bachelor by any means, but I've been on two reality shows, so I know how how it works. How I know how the game works and i just i i i i I, uh, but i I i've been suckered in this season so i gotta see it through kind of like what dre's doing with the los angeles kings now you got a bandwagon no i'm kidding he's sticking to his guns i appreciate that i appreciate that in a person I know about Champagne Gate was a big thing that came out. Oh, uh, yeah. That I think I I clearly I think that was an accident. I think Kelsey is just she's very she's very emotional and the devil works hard, but bachelor producers work harder and they didn't tell them that there was another champagne. So I think they manufactured that. So I know a lot of people were like, oh Hannah Ann manufa- no, she didn't. I mean she's a fake. But she didn't. She didn't know. She didn't know. Andre, um, we obviously know you're basically married. So how's your Bachelor knowledge at these days? Uh, We actually do not watch uh, The Bachelor or Bachelorette that often. Really? Smart. Don't, because you'll get sucked in. (laughs) I do hear that it is quite addictive, though. There are fantasy leagues for The Bachelor. (laughs) Get out. I would 100% believe that. If we can never get that DraftKings sponsor, we will be the first podcast to be happy to bring in the CAC here to talk Fantasy Bachelorette. Oh, that means I have to get suckered in again and again. I don't know, boys. <laughs> I'll do it for you, but... For the pod. For, for the pod. For the pod. <laughs> I'll do it for you guys, but uh, that'll be my only reason to, to continue after this because this, this it's just been a train wreck. I can't wait for Victoria F to get exposed. Anyway, yeah. sorry guys, we're going off topic here. You yeah, have questions we, about hockey? <laughs> we are. Let's see. So we talked about some of the biggest things hockey needs to like improve on to get better. But you know, you mentioned you want these Sunbelt teams to be good, but I mean, there's not really a great way to do that. I mean, unless no. we're saying that the NHL overlords decide to start subtly making things happen behind the scenes so and i sorry to cut you off but this is what happened with vegas so usually what happens with expansion teams in in recent history when the nashville predators and the columbus blue jackets when they came into the league they didn't have leniency that vegas had what happened with vegas hasn't really happened before with expansion teams in the nhl so what the nhl did was they had teams protect up to nine players so it could have been a combination of how many players they want of what kind 
kind of players they wanted, but two had to be defensemen, one had to be a goaltender. So the, the Vegas Golden Knights had a crack at players that were, yes, I said expendable, but were also more talented than other expansion teams had access to in the past. Because Nashville was suffering, Columbus was suffering for many, many, many years. And what happened was, and I think Gary Bettman, who's the commissioner of the National Hockey League, foresaw that and said, look, if we're going to put a team in Vegas, these guys have to be able to contend. And so what they did was they opened the door for Vegas to have access to many players. What is also happening with the Vegas Golden Knights is because Seattle's coming into the league, I think next season, Vegas is exempt from having any of their players on their roster being taken from them. So they're keeping their roster intact. So no one's going to be sacrificed because Bettman knew in order to make Vegas work, they had to be competitive. Nobody saw them going to the finals. Believe me, I was a fan for the jokes. And I didn't even see it happen. But that's what, what the NHL did for Vegas. Now, again, it depends on the general managers. It depends on how they draft, how they develop players, obviously. But I think a big portion of why there has been such a turnaround in the Sun Belt teams is because they've been competitive. They've sucked for a while, but they've drafted high. They've developed players, and they've been able to be competitive. Final hockey question. Sure. Is Happy Gilmore considered a hockey movie? It depends on who you talk to. And I'm going to try to get through this question quite quickly because my battery is at like 10% and it's burning hot. Uh, kind of like my rage when I hear about the Boston Bruins. I would have to go with no. I know some, I would go <laughs> no. Some people would say yes. Uh, it depends on who you talk to. I've watched Happy Gilmore. It's a funny film. The thing is, it's not, <laughs> it's about a hockey player, yes, but it's, it's not really about a hockey team or a hockey player playing the game. So... It's a comedy. I actually made fun of Adam Sandler in front of his wife unknowingly while I worked at the CN Tower. That oh my weird. gosh. I, I was how? in a encounter. I, so here's, so I'll give you the quick rundown of, as to what happened. So I was working at the CN Tower and it's basically working there is like Dawson's Creek, but in a tower. It's a soap opera. So I was talking with this girl that worked with me and we were talking, Adam Sandler was filming Pixels at the time. And so she told me about that. And I said, you know, Adam Sandler hasn't really had a hit. Now this is back in 2014 at this point. So I said, he hasn't had a, had a hit in a really long time. She's like, what do you mean? And at this point, this woman who's looking very familiar is coming to our direction. And so I go, well, he's done like he's, he hasn't really done anything since really the longest yard that's been really funny. He's been mostly like, my mama said, my mama said, eh, eh. and I did this impression of Adam Sandler. That's where his, this woman that looks so familiar sees me doing this impression and she laughs. She has two girls with her. One of her daughters looks exactly like Adam Sandler. Now, I thought that was my paranoia. Turns out it wasn't because she said that she had reservations at the restaurant. The girl that I was working with showed her where to go and she starts laughing. I go, why are you laughing? She goes, that's Adam Sandler's wife. She had a reservation for lunch. <laughs> And I was like, oh my, God. and I'm very loud. So I, looking back, I'm like, she had to have heard where I said that Adam Sandler hasn't had a hit since Longest Yard. So I'm like, oh my God. But she thought the impression was funny. She laughed. I didn't get fired. So there was that. But Happy Gilmore, is it a hockey movie? <laughs> <laughs> I say no. A lot of people say yes. It's a, it's a, it's a cop out, but that, I'm sticking with that. <laughs> well, I had to give you your is Die Hard a Christmas movie type question here. You know what? I mean, it depends on who you talk to. I would, if, if, with the Die Hard thing, I would probably have said no, but I'm like, you know what? But the more I think about it, it is a Christmas movie. It's just not the traditional Christmas movie. Yeah. Dre, you have an opinion on Die Hard as a Christmas time movie? I agree. It goes perfect with Christmas time. I mean, you got the wintery setting. It yeah. plays all the time around the Christmas time. So I agree. And, I would watch it. And you know what? I've considered Lethal Weapon to be a Christmas movie, and it's it's on par with Die Hard. It's it's you know it's cop movie set in L.A. during Christmas. So I'm like, it's a Christmas movie. I don't know why for so long I said it wasn't when I, I had different I had a different opinion about Lethal Weapon. It is what it is. <laughs> it's a Christmas movie. Okay, guys. Well, it's been a long one. Kat, I'm appreciate sorry. you. Appreciate you coming on, Dre. I'm as sorry, always, and I thank you for it. interrupting your work trip to come on, and thank you guys for joining on the Slump Buster episode twenty-seven. Rolling hard, rolling through another episode. Check out the cat on Face Off hockey podcast you want to plug everything real quick yeah sure thank you very much again for this opportunity dre and julian it's uh it's so nice uh to talk to you on instagram uh but to talk to you guys in person is is much more of a joy uh we're at face off puck pod on twitter and instagram or face off hockey podcast on facebook in terms of uh finding us on social media you can find giovanni siciliano at the uh at writer giovanni mike lascaris is at oh no because he has two different ones but i think it's mike <laughs> lasco he, he has to get something 
at linear like i have the double underscore cac but if you just look up our hockey podcast you'll find all our hashtags all our all our handles there in case i really butchered mike's because i know his is a little different uh between the two all right well if you're listening to this pod clearly you know where to subscribe but please check out at slump buster pod on instagram great meme game come for the memes stay for the pod remember to have your animals spayed or neutered and we'll see you on the next episode